What's up? Billy Cardigan here with the Facts and Pedals Arena Corner. And today we're talking to a very cool rock guy from the Butthole Surfer Band who made very cool music with that band. So you're a cool rock guy, right? No, I'm totally not cool. But you're a rock guy. Yeah, I guess so. Butthole Surfers, according to Wikipedia, there's a lot... Lots of drugs were involved in. So are, is taking drugs cool? Is that fun? No, uh, I'm not a drug guy. But some of the scary music that you guys made has a drugs sound to the music. Because it's... As the drug was, was uh, Lone Star beer. Do you still drink the, the Lone Star part. beer? I drink champagne now. Just champagne? That's pretty much it. Every once in a while, something else. But for the most part, it's champagne every night with my wife. So that must get very expensive if you have champagne every night. Yeah, it is an expensive habit. And some champagnes are really expensive and some are not so expensive. The ones I like tend to be in the, you know, 30 to $80 range. So you also produced for the Sublime Band. I see the poster behind you. Yes, was, sir. That's, was that cool? That's why, that's why I'm able to drink champagne every night. So they send you the champagne, the Sublime fellows? No, they, they just send me checks. So they send you checks from them or their lawyer? Well, or from Universal Music. So why do you buy, do you ever buy pedals with that money or just wine or other stuff too? Oh, I buy everything. I buy vacations, uh, kitchen remodeling jobs. I buy all kinds of stuff with that. Behind the gear. Do you ever wear butthole surfers t-shirts in public and then people say, oh, cool band. And you say, hey, I'm actually the guitarist in the band. And then you could sell the CDs out of your trunk. Do you ever do that? No, I never do that. Behind the gear. Uh, one of the first pedals that we got in the band was uh, one of those orange and blue super fuzz pedals. We got it at a pawn shop for 50 bucks. And we took it to practice and we loved it so much that Gibby and I almost got into a fist fight over who's going to get to, you know, keep it. I think Pete Townsend from the, the Who also played one. So the Who, that's like a rock band. And the Butthole Surfers is like a rock band that used that pedal also. So, but you guys are kind of similar to the Who, right? Mm, no. Which is a better band, Who or Butthole Surfers? Oh gosh, I'd have, I'd have to go with the Who. Really? If I had to listen, if I had to listen to one band over and over again, I'd, I'd probably rather listen to the Who than the Butthole Surfers. Behind the gear. Your new album is called Born Stupid. Yes. Is it a cool album? Uh, <laughs> no, it's it's really not at all. It's pretty dorky. You know, I, I kept trying to record some rock songs, and then I, I would just think, you know, I'm an old man. It's it's kind of stupid and silly to be doing rock songs. So I ended up doing carnival music and country western and uh, beer hall sing-along music and just really dumb stuff. It's fun to listen to. I, my wife even likes it and she, she doesn't like everything I do. She doesn't like butthole surfers? Not particularly. Did that cause a lot of marital conflict and strife? No, it's, it's one of the things I adore about her. Behind the gear. She's like, oh, I want you to stop playing that music. And you're like, oh, I like being told. Oh, she, she, would never, she would never tell me to stop. She said, hey, keep doing it, but it sucks. Eh, she never said it sucked, but you know. Well, what does she listen to? Uh, she loves Christmas music. Behind the gear. And you sing on the album, but how can you sing and play guitar? Isn't that like hard? Like, how do you do both? Because most it's like in the Led Zeppelin band, it's like the one guy is the guitar guy and the other guy is like the sing guy. But you were doing both, so that must be very difficult. It's difficult at first, but once you get used to it, it, it becomes pretty easy. You know, when you, when you play guitar, 
day after day, night after night, hours at a time, it, it becomes second nature and uh, you don't even have to look at what you're doing. You just do it and you could probably, you know, the guitar I play, I could probably play in my sleep. You know, it's not, it's not really different. It's not like Jose Feliciano or anything like that. Do you ever sleep with your guitar? No. Oh. But wouldn't it be a good idea to protect it in case an intruder came to... Oh, in the old days, I used to sleep in the van, you know, with our with our equipment. Did anyone ever break in? Well, one night uh, in New York City, you know, I was sleeping in the van, and uh, in the middle of the night, somebody started to break in, and it was really scary because they they were breaking in, and there was no way for me to get out the back. I, you know, the only way out was through the front, and that's where they were breaking in. And I banged on the side of the van and said, "Hey, I'm in here," and that didn't stop them. They were still breaking in. And then our uh, our beloved pit bull Mark Farner started growling with that pit bull sound, and and that's that stopped them in their tracks. So our, our dog saved me. Is there any like drugs or alcohol for dogs that's available? Uh, I know I know cats have catnip, but I don't know what dogs do. Because dogs I think maybe 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 cat turds is what dogs do. I was going to say dogs eat feces of other animals, so maybe that's a delicious. So would you ever reward the pip like if like there's a guy's trying to rob your van and then the dog scared them away? Did you ever say, hey, here's a piece of cat feces as a reward? Well, you know, the funny thing about it is you never have cat feces when you need it. It's always there when you don't need it. Behind the gear. Now one thing I worry about when dogs and cats are in the same situation is what if they fight each other and it's a large dog and he eats the cat or bites its head off? That could be a bad problem, you know, if the I'm sure it's happened they eat the other. Now, I once had a dog that was fighting with the cats, and he would also drink his own urine. He would lean his head down underneath his belly and try to stick his tongue out to, to catch the stream of urine that was coming out of his penis. Maybe he was telling you he was thirsty and you should give him some water. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, I didn't. I saw, I saw a goat once tied, tied with, by a rope to a a stake in the ground and I watched him pee into his own mouth and uh, that's an image that has stuck with me for the rest of my life. So was the stream able to enter his mouth easily or was it an effort to lean down? Because humans, we have hands, so with our penis we could point it upwards with our hands and lean down and quite easily drink the stream of urine, but a dog doesn't have hands to control the trajectory of the penis. Yeah, but a dog is, is horizontal automatically, so it doesn't have to, you know, go up as far. But this dog was had a, it was a big effort because he had to stick his tongue up very far to reach the urine stream, and it seemed like a challenge. So maybe a good thing to do would be to attach, like, a straw to, like, dogs' penises so that they can easily drink the urine. That would be convenient. You know, you can do the same for, for the Marines. I believe, you know, the Marines drink their own urine as part of their training because it tastes good and because you might be in the desert somewhere without access to water and, and you need to drink your own urine to stay alive what about eating your own feces do they do that no i don't think there's any benefit to, to doing that have you ever drinking urine no have you ever eaten feces nope behind the gear there was a period where i didn't really pedal so much as just uh, rack mount delays but yeah i'm a pedal guy so what is a rack mount delay? Uh, like a DM 1100 where, you know, it's fits in a rack and, and you, you know, it's not like something you put on the floor with a button that you push with your foot. Because normally pedals are cool because yeah, you put them on the floor and you press the button, but if it's not that, then it's like another thing. I guess so. Behind the gear. What did that effect do for the butthole surfer? Uh, it was mostly uh, very long delays with repetition and, and pitch changing. Uh, I did it on guitar and uh, Gibby did it on his vocals as well. So do you ever tire of him using it and say, hey, please turn that off? No, it was the best part of our show. <laughs> Behind the gear. We didn't start out being called the, the butthole surfers. I think we were called uh, nine foot worm makes own food or something like that. So that has no penis or vagina or butthole in it? No, although there was a, was a lot of that and other names that we used. We would change the name of our band every, every time we played until one night, uh, the bass player for the big boys, he didn't know what to call us. And he knew he had a song called Butthole Surfer. 
So he called us the butthole surfers. At the end of the night, they gave us like 200 bucks and asked us to come back. So that was it. Behind the gear. Like, so the butthole surfers music is very scary. Like you had the song about the graveyard. Do you ever get, you're playing a song and you get so scared of hearing it that you just stop playing it? Cause it's so frightening and scary. No, but I have seen, I've seen that happen to some people before. I, I uh, produced a, an album for Daniel Johnston a long time ago and halfway through recording a song, he got scared of his own song and had to stop. And it was disappointing, but I, I had to respect that. Behind the gear. Are you familiar with the Big Muff? Is it a big pedal? Great big green thing that was built in Russia. They, they started out. They started out back in the old days as a silver pedal by Electro Harmonics, and, and then they um, were built by Russia in green. They still make different versions of them, but there's one particular lineup that the Soviets made. Uh, that John Paul Jones act, actually bought that pedal for me, and I would never go anywhere without that pedal. It's it's just wonderful. It's it's more fun than the Super Fuzz even. So who is John Paul Jones? He is the bass player for Led Zeppelin. So Led Zeppelin's like a cool rock band. So how did you meet him? You like snuck backstage or something? No, uh, when we signed to Capitol Records, um, our A and R our A and R guy uh, Lee Lust came up with the idea to, to work with him, and and he approached. You know, he sent John Paul Jones a letter asking if he'd be interested, and he was interested. Did he like the dirty words of the band name and the dirty words in the songs, or did he say, "Hey"? I think he don't use those dirty words anymore because I was in Led Zeppelin and we don't Oh like no, he, he, he never said anything like that. He was amused by the fact that we had an album called Hairway to Steven. Hairway to Steven? Behind the gear. Is he cooler than the other Led Zeppelin guys? Well, I've never met the other Led Zeppelin guys. Because back in the 70s, they were always at the front and they were hot and they had their shirts off and stuff like that. So then he was kind of in the back so you couldn't see if he was hot. You couldn't even tell if he was hot or not, you know? So is he hot? Well, he was a little older when he worked with us, but uh, we did take him to the to the lake outside of Austin and we rented a boat and went around on a boat with our friends and he was wearing a Speedo. That was pretty cool. Behind the gear. So what album of the Butthole Surfer Band did John Paul Jones from the Led Zeppelin Band produce? It was called Independent Worm Saloon. And was that a cool album? Yeah, you know, you're asking the wrong person about that. We had a song called Who's In My Room that night and... Um, that's a, I saw that video on YouTube, very scary video. It's a very dark oh, yeah. theme of nightmare of the who is in my room and it could be a demon or some other evil entity. Yeah, that was a, a fun video to make. We borrowed a hot rod from Robert Williams and we had Flea come in and, and play a part. And then we had animation done by uh, Wes Archer who was a head animator for the Simpsons at the time. So it was, it was like a whole lot of fun. Was Flea cool or is he like, cause he's always like naked and stuff and that must be awkward to be around naked people and stuff, right? Well, but he, was, he was, was, was in a Speedo too. So it seems like a lot of people around this project were kind of a, a nude type of person. Well, Flea was never nude around us, but yeah, he was, he's a super fun guy to be with. You know, we, he, we played he, shows back with him in the day before they, they hit it big. There was actually a time when they were jealous of us because we had a tour bus. And that probably lasted about a week before they were, you know, huge. Now, in the early days of the Red Hot Peppers, they had George Clinton produce their album. And George Clinton signed my CPAP machine, actually. I have sleep apnea. Do you have that? I don't have sleep apnea, but uh, I have hung out with George Clinton before. I, I ate breakfast with him uh, three mornings in a row in Japan one time. And what did he eat for breakfast? And what did you eat for breakfast? I had scrambled eggs. I, I, I think he did as well, but I can't remember. That was a long time ago. Behind the gear. You also produced the Meat Puppet Band. Yes. Was that cool? That was very cool. That was my first uh, paying production job. And I got that job because uh, they wanted John Paul Jones to produce their album. So they asked me to ask him. And John Paul Jones turned him down. So then they asked me. And so I, I got that job because John Paul Jones turned him down. Why did he turn them down? Is it because they didn't have the scotch whiskey that he was looking after or? Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure they would have had plenty of scotch for him, but uh, I played the meat puppets for him at the studio quite a bit and he seemed to like them. So I was really surprised when he, when he said no. So you produce 
Are you as good as John Paul Jones at producing? Probably not. So we're the meat Although puppets. I don't, you know, I don't know what his biggest success is, but uh, you know, I can't, I can't say. Were the meat puppets pissed off that you didn't get John Paul Jones for them? No, they they were disappointed for a second and said, "How about you? Do you want to do it?" And I said, "Yes." And and uh, you know, I got them a, a big radio hit and a gold album, so they were happy. Behind the gear. So, what do you think is better, butthole surfers or meat puppets? Meat puppets for sure. Do you think your other bandmates would be offended if you said that to disparage? They, I'm sure they would agree with me. So, if that's a better band, then why didn't you join that band? They never asked. Behind the gear. You're a pretty slim guy. Is well, it I, you, I, used, I used to be, but then I, I got old and, you know, I like the good life, so... Have you ever have you ever tried the keto diet? The keto diet? I wrote yeah. several books about the keto diet, but I haven't tried it. You wrote books about it, but you haven't tried it? Yeah, I have a book called Keto for Kids, and I also wrote Quarantine Keto for how to eat, you know, wildlife squirrels and cats and rats and stuff like that during the coronavirus if there's a food shortage and social decay and stuff. We used to hang out with Johnny Depp and he would bring, one time he brought his dad to one of our shows. And so backstage I was hanging out with Johnny Depp's dad and he started talking about the days when they were living in Kentucky when him and Johnny would shoot squirrels and eat them. Oh, so Johnny Depp eats squirrels? Well, he did when he lived in Kentucky. I doubt he does it anymore. <laughs> Is Johnny Depp keto? I doubt it. Because if he was, he could definitely eat squirrels as part of the keto diet, if that's what he likes. Behind the gear. So do you ever get in an argument with Gibby about the keto diet? Like he's like, oh, let's go to this restaurant. And you're like, well, no, because it's not keto. I don't think I've been to a restaurant with Gibby since, uh, since going keto. You know, when I, back when we were hanging together, we would eat whatever was in front of us. Even feces, even cat feces or... Well, no, probably not. Because you, you, you said you never ate feces. Um, once again, I have never eaten feces. Behind the gear. So are you like an old guy who records like on tapes or do you do like just record into the computer? I'm a computer guy. I have Pro Tools. So how does that work? Because with the old albums, such as probably the ones you did with the Meat Puppets and others, you hit record and then it's like a tape thing. But now there's no record button. You just plug it into the computer and you press a click on the thing and it's recording. So how does that work? Well, in the old days, you know, you, you had tape and tape is pretty expensive. And so you, you know, maybe you were lucky you had 14 reels of tape that you got to use. And so you had to really pay attention. You'd have, you know, if you were recording a song and you didn't know if it was a good version or not, you couldn't just keep recording versions and then pick one out later. You had to know it on the spot and say, that's the one we're going to work on that. <laughs> and then with, you know, like a, a band like Sublime, their songs tended to be eight minutes long. So uh, I recorded them at, at the Willie Nelson studio outside of Austin. And so they would, they would record their eight minute songs and go out to the golf course and, and play golf. And when they would come back, I, there would be a pile of tape on the floor and their songs would be three and a half minutes long. So you were chopping the songs down? Chopping songs down. Did they get mad? They said, don't chop that. They never said anything. They were, but why would they not be mad? Because if they made it eight minutes, then how did they know that it would be good if it was shorter? Because wouldn't you get paid more if it was longer? Well, it certainly doesn't uh, get on the radio if it's very long. Because the longer the radio, it is, the more money you make, right? If they play it. And when they're long, they tend to not play it. But why would they not play it? Because it fills up more time, so the DJ has to do less. If they played longer <laughs> songs, they would have less work to do. So if I was a DJ, I would find the longest songs to play, and then I could take a break, drink a water or soda or whatever beverage I wanted. And then after 20 or 30 minutes, you know, like sometimes like in these ro old rock things like Led Zeppelin, it's like they go on for so long and they just keep playing. But it's nice because you can just leave the room and not listen. And then when you come back, it's over and then you can just and then it's over. Yeah, I miss those old days, you know, the 20 minute drum solo and all of that. Behind the gear. So why isn't there longer songs on your albums, like 20 minute songs and stuff? Well, there probably is somewhere. You know, like I say, I'm, I'm not real good at remembering what our songs are, but uh, 
sometimes we forget what we're doing and we just go on and on, especially live. Well, I, I know we played a song for 45 minutes once. So 45 minutes, that's a long time. It sure is. And you just that, that would be what you would call alcohol fueled. But don't you have to pee like while you're playing? Well, that's the amazing thing. Even if you have to pee before you go on stage, you go up there and you sweat so much that afterwards you don't have to pee anymore. It all just comes out of your skin. But if you have to poop, does the poop come out of your skin too? Well, I've, you know, in all of my years, I've never encountered that. Well, maybe next time you play, you could try to eat a lot of food and then wait till you have to poop to go on stage and then see if you play a long song, like an hour long or two hours, see if the feces comes out of your skin. Yeah, that's, I'll keep that one in mind. Yeah, just keep it in mind. Behind the gear. Well, Paul Leary, the cool guy from the Butthole Surfers Band, thank you so much for doing the, telling us about the pedals you used to make the music that you made. <laughs> well, thanks for talking to me. <laughs> Facts and Pedals, Arena Corner.